Good morning, good morning. How you guys doing? Great. That is awesome. Good to see you guys. I, I, man, I just, I swanny. I just, I swanny. That's a southern term, isn't it? I swanny. <laughs> Where did I swanny come from? What does it even mean? Um, it's great to have you guys. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but uh, how many people had a little bit of a rough week? Okay, okay, that's cool. Me too, me too. Had a little bit of a rough week, uh, you know, from just being honest. Uh, we, I got sick Monday, Tuesday with the kind of sick that you don't want to be sick. And uh, could hardly get out of bed on Tuesday. We were supposed to be going to Florida. You know, it kind of kind of ruined our plans, although we I woke up Wednesday morning feeling a little bit better. And like, okay, well, we changed our mind. We weren't going. Now we changed our mind, decide we are going. We jump in the car and uh, start traveling down. Our daughter's in nursing school down at, uh, in Paul Beach Atlantic. So we're going down there. She's got this white coat ceremony, whatever that means. And uh, she puts a little white coat on and they, you know, do this special little ceremony. So it's awesome to be there. But, you know, driving 95 is horrible. <laughs> How many people hate 95? All right. I'd rather take the scenic route. And I remember going down there and it's like, we, Ashley and I, we get on the road and it, you know, doesn't go for very long. And we realize, man, why did we get on 95, you know? Finally, we get down there and Thursday was great. You know, we're able to go to the, able to go to the ceremony and then Friday, get back in the car and get back on 95. Yeah. And realize again, why you hate 95. And, but it, it was, you know, yesterday was pretty good. But I, I'd say it's probably one of those weeks where I really kind of struggled through it. I don't like to give the enemy credit. But sometimes I believe that the devil tries to do everything he can to mess you up. All right? Now, I don't, I don't like giving him credit when he doesn't deserve credit because he don't deserve nothing. But, but I believe that the enemy tries to mess us up throughout the week because he don't want us to get to this point. Right, and I love coming into these moments, man. It's always just so refreshing to my spirit to be able to sit here to worship together. It's just great for the beginning, for for the beginning of my week. But what, what, as I was as I was going through this week, I was reminded of this and the topic that we're actually going to talk about this morning. Uh, Michael and has already talked about is this whole idea, our core value of of. Uh, of uh, give generously. So we've been walking through over the por- over the course of these last like seven weeks, we've been talking about the mission of the church, not something that we created, but looking at the Bible and saying, okay, what is it the Bible says that we're actually supposed to live out? So back, uh, back in September, we started talking about the mission, right? The mission that God's given his church. And we see that in, we see that in, in the book of Acts is that, and also in the gospels that Jesus told us that we're supposed to preach the word, we're supposed to make disciples, and then we're supposed to care for others, care for the hurting, care for the broken. And we saw those as foundational things. And then we talked about how we kind of do that practically here. Ronnie did that on Labor Day weekend, a practical message on these are some of the five things that we've kind of given ourselves to we believe that God's called us to and then over the course of the last five weeks we've been walking through these core values they're not things that we just said hey we think we ought to do these we we looked at the scripture said we believe that as followers of Jesus and as a part of his church that these are the things that missionally God has given us to live out not only individually but also as as a church and so we started talking about the first week, how, it, you know, that Jesus calls us to live by faith. There are a lot of things, I don't know if you know this, but following Jesus, there are a lot of things that he calls you to do that just don't make sense, right? And if you're not in the process of doing something that really doesn't make sense, then my question would be, are you really living by faith? Right? Because he talks about how we are to have the faith of a mustard seed. We gave everybody a little bag of mustard seed. And it's not about how much faith you have. Right? Because sometimes I think we get, we get messed up and think, well, I don't have enough faith. We've even heard people in the church say, well, that must not have happened because you didn't have enough. Because you didn't have enough faith. It's not about how much faith you have. It's about what kind of faith that you actually have and who you're actually putting your faith in. 
is what really matters. So we talked about that first week. And then we, we talked about loving your neighbor, right? We know that the greatest commandment says that we're to love, love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and we're to love our neighbor as herself. And so we gave everybody a little, piece of, a little piece of paper, and it's got houses all around it. It puts you in the middle. And my question is, do you even know your neighbor? Because sometimes, right, the, the Scripture said, well, who's, Jesus was talking to one of the, uh, one of the um, uh, people in Scripture, and he said, well, who's my neighbor? And Jesus trying to help him understand that really, anybody's your neighbor, but, for, and, but the reality of it is, is that most of us don't even actually know our neighbor. Because we have grown up in a garage door society. You pull in, your garage door goes up. You pull, pull your car in, your garage door goes down. And we half the time don't even know the people that we actually live around. We don't even know their name. And so we talked about what it means to love your neighbor. And then, and then we talked about praying continuously. That, that was one of the things in Thessalonians that says rejoice always, pray continually. So we started the prayer wall over here and said, what are the things that you're praying about? What are the things that maybe God is asking you to re-engage in to pray about? Because maybe you stopped praying because you thought, well, God's not answering it. And so you began to re-engage, and that's what's really cool is that these are some of the answers that we've been seeing over the course of the last few weeks, even some of the things that we've seen God doing. So we just thought it really important for us as a church to begin to understand what does it look like to actually have a life of prayer, right? We don't, we're not just called to get up in the morning and go into our prayer closet and pray, but we're supposed to learn what it means to have a lifestyle of prayer throughout your day. And so that was the challenge. And then last week we had the bridge up here and we talked about sharing our faith, sharing the gospel with somebody, sharing the actual message of Jesus, that it it can be as simple as walking over a bridge, taking some simple steps to actually begin to share our faith. And we talked about we're not the bridge, that the cross was the bridge and Jesus was the bridge to God, but we are to be bridge builders. We're to be bridge builders, not wall builders that one of the biggest things that most of the time we do in sharing our faith is that we actually judge people before we actually do anything else. And, and people in a survey actually said they just wish Christians would not judge people, but would be willing to just share their faith honestly with that, and share their doubts and just be honest about sharing their faith. And so, the, and now today we're looking at this whole idea of give generously. Again, these are biblical, foundational, missional things that God's called the church to that we believe are a part of who we are as individuals, but they're also a part of who we are as a church. And so it made me think about this. Life is a stewardship, right? Life is a stewardship. Everything you've been given is a gift from God. And you've been given the responsibility to steward it and to steward it well. And so that's why we say that life is a stewardship. And so we have to begin to evaluate ourselves this morning and say, how are we stewarding the things that we've been given? We're constantly asking ourselves that as a staff, as a leadership team, as we're trying to manage Jesus Church. We're trying to say, hey, how are we stewarding the things that we've been given. And so life is a stewardship. You see, generosity helps us put our focus on God and not ourself. So that's what we're trying to kind of focus on this morning is generosity. It's, it's not just about money, right? Initially, when you guys heard generosity, you probably saw this sign. You're like, oh, there he goes. Pastor Chris, talking about money. Well, I I hope you know that actually money is the second most thing talked about in the Bible. 2,100 verses in the Bible that reference themselves to money. But we're not talking about money this morning. We're talking about generosity. We're talking about having a heart of generosity. And what we do is as we learn to be generous people like God's called us to, we actually learn that as Americans, we have to take our focus off of ourselves and begin to put our focus on Jesus and who he's become. And the other thing is that generosity reminds us that it's our responsibility to build his kingdom, not our kingdom. 
to build his kingdom and not our kingdom. Because we live, listen, we live in a culture that says, you deserve it. You deserve it. You do it your way. Get the fastest, quickest, shiniest thing that you could possibly, always new, always new. You can't sit down and watch any TV show without something new coming up. You can't get a, you can't get a newspaper. They still have newspapers? You can't get a newspaper. You, can't, you definitely can't get on Facebook. And constant ads. You know your phone's listening to you? You ever, you ever realize that you're talking about something with someone and then you get on it and you're like, wow, I was just talking about that. We were just talking, we were talking about that the other day. Ashley and I were talking about something in a conversation, you know, and we're like, oh, wow. Uh, we were talking about, we were, it's really weird. <laughs> I'm not going to say, okay. And it popped up on our Facebook thing, like an ad popped up on about what we were just talking about in the car. And we're like looking around like, okay, the enemy really is listening. And so, this, but this generosity helps remind us that we're not trying to build our kingdom, but we're trying to build his kingdom. And I hope that what you know that at the foundation of this church, when we stepped into launching the church and becoming a church, that was at, that's at the core of everything that we do is that, well, I'm not here, you know, it's really easy as a pastor of a growing church, there are a lot of pastors who've become consumed with growing churches and they've become more about them than they actually have about the church in the gospel, to be really honest with you. And, and I've tried to do everything I possibly can to keep people on in my life who help keep me humble because I know that what God has given me, he can actually strip away at any moment. And so holding that very loosely is really important, but also being intentional. And so the, the understanding for us here this morning is that the things that God has given us, he's given to us as steward. Your job, he's given you that to steward. Your money, he's giving you that to steward. Your family, he's giving you that to steward. If you're a dad here this morning, you've been given a family to steward them, not to be a deadbeat. But to steward them, the, the, the things that God has given you, you're like, well, I worked hard for it. Yeah, you worked hard for it, but you didn't, you didn't do that. You weren't able to work without God giving you the ability to actually work for that. And so understanding that helps us begin to understand as we understand generosity, being people of generosity, then it helps put our focus on the fact that it's our responsibility to build his kingdom and use the things that God has given us for his glory and not ours. Because man, it's going to suck one day when you stand before God and say, man, God, you see what I did with all that money? And he's going to say, I don't see no U-Haul. That he really didn't care about what you did with your money unless you stewarded it well for his glory or your time or your talents or your resources. You know that you're in the 1% richest people in the world. And so it's, you know, this kind of thing should be, listen, it should be really easy for us. But to be honest with you, we live in a culture that doesn't teach us a whole lot about generosity, but build me, build me, build my kingdom, get what I need, watch out for me, do my thing. And Jesus' message this morning is to not, not Pastor Chris's message. Jesus' message here this morning and the word of God actually teaches us something very contrary to that. And so if you want to get mad at somebody, you can get mad at God. Take it out on him. Because in the past, I've been accused of building my own kingdom. And that's as far from the truth as it can possibly be. I'd be willing to give this up tomorrow if God gave me the opportunity. Because I didn't want it in the first place. 
but I trust that as God continues to lead us, he's doing something. But so, so what we're trying to help you understand is that over the course of these last really seven weeks, we've been building this foundation of what the mission looks like that God's given us because in the course of the next five weeks, we're gonna begin to talk about the vision that God's given us as a church. And I really wanna encourage you to be here the next five weeks. I really believe that what God has for us, it talks about faith. It talks about loving our neighbor. It talks about praying continuously. It talks about sharing the gospel. It talks about this heart of generosity. So let's look at what the word says. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 is, uh, we're going to look at the first seven verses of 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and then we're going to jump from there into 2 Corinthians chapter 9, where Paul again is writing and do a couple of verses there in, in chapter 9. So what, what we're at is that Paul is writing this letter to the church in Corinth. And what he's using, he's using this letter to write to them, to encourage them in their faith. Now, what had happened is when the Romans came in and the Romans took over, they actually um, uh, took everything from those who were living in Jerusalem. And so there was a lot of people who were living in Jerusalem at the time who had become poor. And the Macedonians were a part of that. And so what Paul is doing, if Paul is writing to this church in Corinth who's really struggling, they have, a, they have great faith, they have a lot of things, but he's encouraging them in their generosity. And what he's helping them to understand is that the Macedonians were actually giving, giving to others, they were living lives of generosity out of their poverty, the really interesting thing that I find is that a lot of times the most generous people are the people who have less money than the people who have more money. You know why? Because their heart's not tied to their money. Their money, their, their heart's not tied to the things of this world. And that's why I try to always encourage you, as, as Matthew 7 says, wherever your treasure is, there your heart will be also. How tied are you to the house that you live in, to the car that you drive, to the job that you have, to the bank account that you have, to the things that you've been given? How tied are to you? And what would happen if at one moment that was actually gone? Would your heart still be tied to it? Or would you trust that God's doing something even greater and bigger than what you could ever imagine? So let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 7. It says this, And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme, what? Their extreme poverty welled up in rich, in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability. Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege. They pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in, in this service to the Lord's people. And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves what? First of all, to who? They gave themselves first of all to the Lord, right? Because we said generosity actually begins to help us put our focus on the things that really matter and on God himself. And it takes our focus off of other things when we truly live out of a heart of generosity. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord and then by the will of God also to us. So we urge Titus just as he had earlier made a, begin, a beginning to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. But since you excel in everything, okay, so now he's talking about the, Corinth, the Corinthian church. He says, now that you excel, uh, excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we have kindled in you, see that you also, say also, that you also excel in the grace of giving. And so he's like, man, your faith's great. Your speech is great. Your knowledge is great. But don't lose sight. Don't disconnect those things from something else that really is really important that the Bible actually talks about that's really important to God. And that's a heart of generosity. You can't disconnect the two. 
And so let's look at what this scripture actually teaches us. Then I'm going to jump to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. I'm going to give you some questions to reflect on. And then we're going to do something special in just a moment. The first thing is this, a heart of generosity is birthed out of a heart for Jesus. A heart of generosity is birthed out of a heart for Jesus. It's really interesting because if I were probably to ask the majority of you in here, or every one of you, you know, tell me about what is the one thing that's the most important thing in your life? You probably would say, God. You probably would say, God. My, you know, that's the really more important, that's the most important thing. But then my question to you is, if you were to actually sit back and begin to evaluate things, how, how really important is it? Like, practically, how really important is, how can you give me evidence that God is the most important thing? Can you list a couple of things that you would say, hey, hey man, this is the most important thing. Because when God asks us for something, He's not asking us for just a few parts. He's asking us for everything. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And here's what what we tend to do is most of the time we want to give God, we want to give God everything, but maybe one or two things we don't. We like to disconnect our finance, stewardship of our finances from our relationship with God. Hey, God, I'll give you everything, but don't ask me for this. Hey, God, I'll give you everything, but don't ask me for this. Don't take this relationship away from me. Don't take this house away from me. Don't take my kids and send them to Florida. No, I'm being honest, right? Ashley and I were talking about, we were, we, were dri- we were driving back and we were like, hey, you know, what happens if all our kids don't live in the same place? That's going to suck. What if one of them lives in Florida? Man, I don't want that. I don't want that. And guess who will be driving 95 even more if Anna Kate ends up in Florida? You're like, well, get on a plane. Maybe not. And, and so understanding it, and, and then Ashley and I coming to the realization, we were never really even close to our parents because God always took us to other places. We can't, and when God calls you to go somewhere, you're like, hey, God, um, okay, if you'll send me there, is it, okay, mom and dad go with me? Moms and dads, the greatest thing you can do is surrender your kids to the Lord. And let them follow him. And then if God gives you the opportunity to go periodically and spend some time with them, then you celebrate that as a blessing. But you want them to follow, that you want them to follow him and not be, not be codependent on you. That one hurts, right? I know the feel, I know the feeling. Because now when I got older kids and they start to struggle, I want to jump in and fix the problem. Pastor Daddy to the rescue. (laughs) And I constantly, Ashley and I have to constantly remind ourselves, we got to step back and let them struggle and see God in the struggle. You see, a heart of generosity is birthed out of a heart for Jesus when we recognize what we've been given. You see, generosity is a byproduct of a heart that actually loves Jesus. It's a byproduct of a heart that actually loves Jesus. Second thing is this, a heart of generosity is birthed out of a heart of contentment. That's one thing as Americans we're not good at. We're not good at contentment because we have all these, we have all these messages and things flying out to our face. Hey, we need that. Hey, you need this. Facebook ad. Hey, Amazon, right? You can get anything on Amazon. You probably could find a, a bride on Amazon <laughs> if you looked hard enough. Pay the right amount. Get the right person. I mean, you could have your list and probably check them all off. And they, that relationship would be horrible. But heart of contentment, Paul wrote in Philippians, so this is a guy who knows about contentment, 
verse 12, he said, I know, what is, I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. And so he understands this contentment. What would it look like? Because I believe that Jesus calls his church to be people of contentment, not always looking for something bigger, better, faster, newer. You know, I, I've always been intrigued. You ever gone new car shopping? Don't do it. And don't take your wife, guys. Right? Not because... Not like I took my wife one time car shop. We went car shopping. And, and as soon as we get there, I had already prepared Ashley. I said, listen, the guy's not going to do anything, but he's going to talk to you. And what happened? Yep. He talked to her like, oh, sit in this. And she said, oh, let's take a drive. You know, we go for a drive and we, you know, he stops to get out and he's like, oh, Ashley, why don't you drive? I'm like, you little sucker. Because as soon as you get in there, you start to get that new car smell. You're like, mm, I surely would love to have this. And that's happening, I think. And we've, we've, lost the, we've lost the art of being content with the thing. I'm not saying that you can't have new things. My question would be is when you're buying new things, how are you stewarding other things? And are, are you just buying something new because you just want something new? But what if we had a heart that was birthed, a heart of generosity was birthed out of a place of contentment? Because the second thing is this, is that a heart of, or the third thing is a heart of generosity comes from a life of stewardship. You cannot have, be generous with the things that you have if you don't have margin in your life. Right? You got to have margin in your time. Do you structure your day in such a way that you don't have time for other people? You got to be here. You got to be there. You got to do this. You got to do that. And, and there are people passing you all, all day long. And you can't even be generous toward them even with your time because you're so stressed out. I've always wondered when I talk to individuals who are so stressed out over, your job, over their job, I'm just like, Why? Well, I got to do this. I got to. No, you just choose. That's what you choose to be stressed out over. A heart of generosity comes by a place of contentment. It comes by a life of stewardship. You can't be generous if you don't have margin in your life. If you don't have time to use the talents and the abilities God has given you, you don't have margin in your life to be able to bless people financially when God gives you that opportunity. A heart of generosity comes from a life of stewardship. And, what you, and how you steward it matters. The last thing is this, is that you, generosity, generosity takes sacrifice. It takes sacrifice, right? Look at the, okay, Paul's talking to the church in Corinth and he's talking about the Macedonians. He didn't say, hey guys, guess what? The Macedonians, they have all kinds of money. They've, God's just blessed them so much. Their, their barns are overflowing. No, he, what, what Paul actually says, hey guys, guess what? The Macedonians, they're blessing others out of their poverty, they're blessing people and they're blessing others out of their poverty. And you tell me, if you're going to bless someone out of your poverty, then you're having to make a sacrifice. And I believe that if we're not careful, what as Americans, we buy into the lie that if it's, if it's inconvenient for us, then it's a problem. And my question is, are we willing to make sacrifices? And so let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 11. It says this. So Paul jumps, jump over to chapter 9. Paul again is writing to the church in Corinth. And this is what he says to them. Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. 
Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly. That's what I love. You realize that in our generosity, God wants to bless us, that even, in our, if, even if it's in our poverty, there's still blessing in generosity, that God wants to bless us. That doesn't mean, oh, if you go out and you give $5, that doesn't mean that you might, you might get $5 back. You might not. Because God doesn't always work that way. But the blessing comes, the blessing comes because we put our focus on the thing that really matters. The focus, the blessing comes because we realize that we're doing, we're actually being faithful because we trust God when it doesn't make sense. That's where the blessing actually comes from. We also know that God says that he knows everything that we need and he's attentive to our very needs. Let's keep reading. Having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. I love that because what we're seeing is we're seeing a group of people who were living in poverty, who were, who were sowing in. They were willing to live a life of generosity. And out of that, they were finding the blessing. And guess who was getting the glory? God was getting the glory. God was getting the glory because can you imagine, listen, here's the reality of it is that every single one of us will stand before God and give an account for how we steward the things that we've been given. Your financial resources, your home, your family, all those kind of things that God has given you as a pure gift from the Lord. He's going to say, how did you do with what I gave you? And it says that he will say to some, sorry, depart from me because I never knew you. And then he will say to others, well done, good and faithful servant. You've stewarded the things that I've given to you. And so welcome into the kingdom of God. Because it was your your priority to focus on the things that really matter. It was your priority to build the kingdom of God and not try to build your own kingdom. It's really interesting. Michael, you guys come on out. Um, A a few years back, I was a a youth pastor and we would go for about 10 years straight, we would go and we would take teenagers into Jamaica. And we would stay in this little hotel there in Jamaica. And and, and during the day, we would kind of go up in, we would go up into the mountains and we spent some time like helping rebuild some of the churches that were up there and had kind of fallen apart. And we would go into some of the villages that were up in the mountains and we'd, we'd invite people to church. We would do vacation Bible schools and some of those types of things. Well, as a part of our trip, every time we'd go for about 10 or 12 days and every trip, we would always take a day and we would go to one of the orphanages there in Jamaica. You see, because when you actually go into another part of the world that's not America and you realize that everybody doesn't have everything, it changes your perspective. But we get sucked into this culture where like Amazon culture, we can order it and have it tomorrow or the next day depending on whether you're a prime member or not. (laughs) Whatever. I'm not downplaying it because it works for me every now and then too. But I can remember we, we took this group of teenagers. I think the kid's name was Tim. And this one day we went to the orphanage. We go, we go to this orphanage for about four or five hours and we spend, we get off the bus. We'd have like 30 teenage, 25 or 30 teenagers and we get off the bus and um, they'd go walking into the orphanage. It was, really, it was really neat to see because the girls would get off and, and as quickly as possibly, as fast as they can, they would sprint to where the babies were. <laughs> there would be like 50 kids there and they'd have like two workers. And they would sprint to where the, they, you know, the one time we went, there was a baby there that was as young as three, 
three months old, three weeks old, three weeks old. And, they, and the girls would go racing, the girls would go racing in there. And you've got these babies who were laying in, their, in these cribs. And, and you could tell they had been laying in the crib for probably a few hours. Their diapers were wet. Some of them, you know, they had pooped all over themselves. And because there was only two workers, they didn't have time to just pay attention to them. And so the girls, they go running in there. And it's really cool to see American girls all of a sudden forget that poop is stinky. <laughs> you liked that, didn't you? They go running in there and they just start helping. They're like cha- changing diapers. And, and, and as soon as they got to one kid, if the, the girl got to one kid, they changed their diaper and they would hold them and they would not put that kid down for the next four hours. The boys, on the other hand, they wouldn't race to the babies. They, they would race out into the yard and some of the little kids would be out there playing soccer and they'd start playing, you know, with these kids that are like four and five, and six, seven, eight years old. And they would play with them and all of a sudden all the boys became like jungle gyms. The kids are hanging all over them. They're trying to play soccer. Well, Tim... Tim had been there the majority of the, he had been there all morning and he kind of gotten connected with this one little kid. And, and we went all the teenagers and said, Hey guys, um, we, we got to go. We got to go. It's time for us to leave. We got to pack up. We got to go. And that one little boy, he went, he jumped in Tim's arm and he wrapped his arms around that, that Tim's neck and he put his legs around him too. And he was not letting go. And so we go, we literally had to walk to the bus. So we've got teenagers that are walking to the bus and they've got kids just hanging all over them. And as soon as we got to the bus door and the door opened, we have to start like peeling kids off of these teenagers. And Tim, we peeled this kid, this little boy off of him. I mean, this was like, it's, it's like that, that, you know, that one boy that you're like, man, God's got to get a hold of him, right? I'm not, I don't know how he's going to do in this orphanage, but, you know, because he's not all that nice, right? You can really tell he just wants nothing to do with it. But as soon as that kid just attached to him, it was a whole different ball game. We had to peel that kid off and that kid's crying and he's screaming and he's kicking and Tim walks over that door and he says, I'm not getting on that bus. He says, you can't make me get on that bus. I'm like, Tim, listen, buddy, I know you want to stay here, but you got to get on the bus. He's like, but who's going to help this kid from now on? I'm like, man, we just got to trust God that this time was for you. This moment was for you. He's like, I'm not getting on that bus. And I literally, we had to take a couple guys. We had to grab him and we had to take him and drag him onto the bus and set him down into the seat. And for the next 45 minute ride back to the hotel, that kid did nothing but bawl and cry. You see, because what began to happen is that those teenagers in that moment, they began to see a different perspective. You see, let's be honest, do we have it too easy in America? We lose the sight of a heart of generosity because we've got everything we need. And when you're thrust into a situation like that, all of a sudden now it begins. And I have those images in my mind year after year after year as a reminder, this is not about me. This is not about my kingdom. And let's be honest, there are people in America that God puts in our place that has given us the opportunity to help. So I want to ask you a couple questions. How generous are you with your time? Do you have margin in your life that throughout your week, even if you're at work, do you have time to stop and actually talk to people? Or have you made life all about you? 
I got to do my thing. I got to get home. I got to pull in the driveway. I got to put the garage door up. I got to pull in. I got to shut the garage door. And I got to do my thing. How generous are you with your talents? How generous are you with the ability that God has given you? You see, because just as much as your time is a gift from God, the gift of the ability that God, you're like, well, I don't know that it, what that is. Then maybe it's time to figure that out. My desire for you is that you stand before God and God says, well done, servant, with the talent and the gifts that I've given you. You use them well. How generous are you with your finances? You see, because I believe this is the one we like to disconnect. We like to disconnect this one from our relationship with God. And here's what I want you to understand is that as much and as important, is reading the Bible important? Yep. Is praying important? Okay. What about your finances? See, we like to disconnect our money but actually how you steward your finances and, and realizing that they're a gift and giving back to God is a part of your responsibility. That's as important a responsibility as reading your Bible. And so how generous are you with your finances do you do you have you put yourself in the in a place where you can create margin where you can live a generous life to people because the money's not going with you how generous and here's the two that really wrecked me just to be honest with you how generous are you with your grace Right? How generous are you with your grace? Because we talked about that. Right? We want to share our faith, but a lot of times we judge people based on what they look like. And people just want to know that they're loved and that we care about them as people. They don't want us as the church. They want us to judge them first. And so I think it's really important for us to be generous with grace. And most of the time, it's with people that you don't want to give grace to. What good is it if it's easy for you to give grace to people? But what about the people that you think they don't deserve it? That actually benefits you to actually give them grace. And that might be the person sitting right beside you. Last one is this. How generous are you with your forgiveness? How generous are you with forgiveness? How generous are you with forgiveness with the people who have hurt you? You see, because that's probably the hardest one. We've become a culture of hurt people, hurt people. And there are people in our lives and we know that unforgiveness, it only paralyzes you. It actually doesn't even hurt the other person. And so my question to you this morning would be, You see, these are all tied. They're tied together. Your time, your talents, your finances, the grace that you give, and your forgiveness. Jesus said, if you don't forgive, he won't forgive. And so how generous of a person have you become? You see, because at the core of it, if we become generous people, it helps us begin to put our focus back on the things that really matter. Because did you know that the church should be the most generous people in the world? We should be the most generous people in the world. And so what we've tried to do as the body of Christ, we've tried to take the tithes and offerings that you're given and we're trying to do the best that we possibly can to steward those and be a church of generosity. Over the years, we've been able to help five different church plants help get started. 
And we're presently in the process of helping the one down in Shalot. We've been able to be a blessing to Lifeline Pregnancy Center and the Bear Foundation. We've been able to help Mana Ministries, who is locally serving over 125 families almost every month. We've been able to to give to Brunswick Recovery Center over the years. We've been, we've been able to uh, help Brunswick Family Assistance with people who are, who are trying to need help with their electric bill and their power bill and their rent and those kind of things. We're, we try and come alongside them because they have a great vetting system. And we're saying, hey, how can we be generous? And I believe that what God's going to call the church to do in the days to come, because I totally believe that Life is just going to get harder and the church can respond because I believe the culture doesn't believe that the church is generous. I believe the culture believes that the church is nothing about money. And I believe that God's called us to something bigger, to be the most generous people in the world. Proverbs 11, 24 through 25. One person gives freely, yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly, but comes to poverty. A generous person will prosper, but whoever refreshes others will themselves be refreshed. And so what we're going to do, you're like, well, what's in the give generously bucket? So we've done this a couple of times as a church is we're actually reverse tithing today. We're actually giving back to you. I have one guy come up to me at the last service. He's like, dude, that didn't feel right. (laughs) So we have an envelope. And in the envelope, it has $20 in it that we want to give one to each family here. And we want you to take this this week We want you to add maybe 20 more dollars to it or $100 or whatever you believe that God wants you to do with it. And we want you to use it as an opportunity to bless someone else. You're like, you're giving this back to me? Yep, I'm giving it back to you. Some of you, I know that some of you are here visiting from out out of town. This is God's gift to you to be able to bless someone else. You see, because we're not tied to anything. Could we use this money to do something for the church? Absolutely. But how awesome would it be for almost 500 people between last service and this service to take out and be able to bless somebody in our community? And I don't go like, oh, Crosswinds Church gave me some money to bless you with. I, I, I will say this. Wow, I am way over. I will say this. I was worried that first service was like going to text everybody. Like, hey, Crosswinds Church is giving money. And like all these new people are going to show up. And we weren't going to have enough. But what I hope is this will help maybe put some perspective on it, like right? Like the mission trip, Tim, the orphans. Maybe this will help put some perspective on it for us. But generosity, I believe, takes sacrifice, and that's why I'm encouraging you to put something with it. The Macedonians, they they bless people out of their poverty, not out of their wealth. Guess what we're doing? We actually are fairly wealthy people. And we're able to take something and give something to someone else and say, hey, I just want to bless you today. Maybe you could even say, hey, would it be okay if I prayed for you? And so I'm going to ask you to do that. So I'm going to ask Ronnie. He's got the envelopes. I got, we got to have some of our leadership team members here. I think I saw Holly there, Chris, Mike Byers. If a couple of you guys could be over, be over here, John, there's. And so what I'm, what I'm going to ask you to do is I'm going to ask you to, to th- this is okay, right? I know it may feel weird, 
but I want you to know it's okay. You're like, well, Pastor Chris, I don't need that. I know you don't need it. But I still want you to come. You're like, Pastor Chris, I'm, I'm leaving today and I'm going back to where? Okay, take it with you and bless somebody else. You see, this is not about building the kingdom around here, but this is about building God's kingdom. And so I'm going to ask you guys in a minute, we're going to, I'm going to ask you to stand and I'm going to ask you to come down the outside aisle, take an envelope, and then if you could go back to your seat that way, and then you guys, the other half, down this aisle and back that way. As we sing this song, Cornerstone, you guys stand with me for just a minute. We're going to sing a, call, uh, a song called Cornerstone. And what it does is it starts to help us put our focus back on the, what really matters. That Jesus is the cornerstone. That he is the focal point. He is the most important thing. And let's make that our gift. Let's make that our desire this morning. God, help me to be a, pers- a generous person that puts my focus on the things of God and it becomes my desire from this point forward, if it's not already your desire, to build the kingdom of God. Let's pray. God, would you just use this time as we commit it to you, as we receive this as a gift from you, but then, God, as we return and decide to bless someone else, God, that you lead us to. In Jesus' name we pray.